Hi everyone, welcome to this series of lectures. These are a series of lectures that deal with legal positivism. Three of them, in fact, and the first one will deal with the history and background to legal positivism. And it will show you where these ideas come from, and that should explain a lot of the issues that come up later. The second lecture will deal with the main ideas of legal positivism, and the third one with legal positivism around the world. So, legal positivism has its origins in 17th century Europe. And from there, it was exported all over the world, literally as a result of colonialism. It could have very different names everywhere, but it's very much a European invention, and specifically an English invention. So it had its origins in three things that happened in the 17th century, namely the Renaissance, the Reformation, and the revolutions. So we are going to look at each of these three aspects in turn. First of these is the Renaissance, which literally means rebirth, something that was born previously and is being born again. And as such, it refers to the rediscovery of classic Greek and Roman culture. So it is a going back to Greek and Roman culture, art, architecture, etc. So, for example, typically Renaissance art, as you see here on the right hand side, um, this is a painting by the artist Raphael, and it's called the School of Athens. You will see Plato and Aristotle right in the middle of the painting, which gives you an indication it's not only going back to architecture and art but also ideas and another example on the left hand side is in the architecture this is st peter's basilica in rome it was built in 1506 to 1615 but if you look at it you will see it looks roman or greek it it doesn't look like the other buildings from before this time it looks greek and roman and that is important because this Renaissance period is also a rediscovery of classic philosophy and law, a rediscovery of philosophical ideas, but also of legal rules and ideas. So we have here pictures of, for example, at the top, the University of Bologna, which is claimed to be the oldest university in the world. It was established in 1088 and is still going strong, very strong. It's a beautiful place. And then on the right hand side, a copy of the Corpus Juris Civilis Justiniani. And that is, of course, what Roman law was based on and what the rediscovery of Roman law was based on. This is what they studied at the University of Bologna. It was a study of Roman law. And so Roman law is rediscovered along with classical philosophy, art, and architecture. So the first aspect we have spoken about, that is the Renaissance. The second aspect that we want to talk about is the Reformation. And of course, the Reformation is the shift from Roman Catholicism to Protestantism in Europe. At its heart, is the idea that the Pope should not have the kind of power that he has, which is a power that is both divine and secular, i.e. he was the head not only of the church, but also of the state. So they reject this power that the Pope had. It also, the second aspect of the Reformation is the emphasis on a personal belief in God, and a personal relationship with God, rather than a relationship through the means of the church. So it is an idea that people can, for themselves, decide what their faith means. They don't have to wait for the Pope to decide for them. And the important thing is this only becomes possible, the Reformation only becomes possible 
once people are able to read the, the Bible in their own language. So you no longer need a priest to read it in Latin and to tell you what it means. You can read it in your own language. German, English, French, Dutch, whatever. And once people read the Bible for themselves, this undermines the power of the church. So the church is no longer the sole arbiter of the truth when it comes to faith. So this results in a separation being made between church and state. This is a typical American way of saying it, but it does lead to an idea that you must, the power of the church must be limited to church affairs and the power of the state must be limited to civil things. So it ends the divine right of kings to rule. So kings can no longer decide for everyone else, uh, sorry, other way around. The church cannot decide for a state how it should manage its affairs. And this is the, the start of that idea that we have that the church should not prescribe to the state what it should and shouldn't do in its laws. And you can see that this is a firm rejection of the idea of natural law. So it is no longer from natural law that the church gets its rights and that the kings get their rights to rule as sort of the representative of God on earth. The third aspect of 17th century that we need to talk about is revolutions. 17th century is known as the time of political revolutions and it starts with at the bottom there um, the French Revolution uh, which you know ended very badly for anyone with any kind of royal connection, but also what the English like to call with their typical modesty, the glorious revolution, which basically also resulted in kings losing their heads quite literally, and which established the idea that there must be a king in charge of the state, that you need a king to be representative of God and he or she rules through divine right. So it's an end to that and a start of what we eventually call democracy. So um, all these revolutions, although they did not immediately result in what we would today recognize as democracy, they very definitely start the process of changing to a different system. This scientific revolution will have a huge impact in legal philosophy, as we will see in the next lecture, as it tries to make legal philosophy more scientific. So, this one leads to the fact that there are now new questions for legal philosophy to answer. Namely, in the first place, if kings no longer have a divine right to rule, what will the alternative look like? In other words, if we have a new type of government, what gives it legitimacy? Second question is, where will this new type of government get its legitimacy from? So if it's no longer from natural law or from natural rights or from the divine right of kings, where does it come from? Third question, what will set the limits for their power? In other words, what stops the new type of government from being as autocratic as the kings were? And this was the experience in the Glorious Revolution, where the new leader, Oliver Cromwell, became as autocratic as the kings that he had set out to replace. Fourth question, how will we distinguish between law and good law? Now you will remember in natural law, we decide what good law is by looking at whether it conforms to morality. But if morality no longer plays a role, then what will determine whether we have good law? And then the final question is, what will take the place of natural law as the leading philosophy? Spoiler alert, it's legal positivism.